Some time ago we made a video explaining how to figure out if a property required surge protection or not. We went through pages and pages of the regs looking at lightning strike rate maps, figuring out how to find lengths of supply cables to a property, what sort of environment the installation was in, and then doing a long calculation to figure out the risk factor of the damage a lightning strike was likely to cause in order to decide if we should install surge protection or not. So was it all worth it? No. Now when we go back to regulations 443.5, figure 44.2, table 443.1, and figure 44.3, what do we find? All deleted and done away with by Amendment 2, all that careful calculated work for nothing. Well, not really. After all, it was far more likely that we weren't in fact doing all that calculation and just sticking the surge protection in anyway, because as surge protection became increasingly widespread and used, the costs associated with it came down and became negligible. In fact, after much initial furore about the increased need to use them on release of the 18th edition, SPDs started to become included in consumer units as standard much like this circuit protection consumer unit from BG. Just a reminder that if you're watching this on any of our social media platforms, then click the link to watch it as part of our free training package, you'll get a certificate and it'll count towards your annual CPD requirement if you're already watching it as part of that package, then you were born for this. Back to Surge, recognising that SPD use was common practice now, the IET decided to make life a lot easier and with the issue of the Second Amendment it took a simpler, more pragmatic approach to Surge protection. In Regulation 443.41 which relates to transient overvoltages due to the effect of indirect lightning strokes we read, Protection against transient overvoltages shall be provided where the consequences caused by the overvoltage could result in I. Serious injury to or loss of human life. Can't argue with that one. Failure of a safety service as defined in Part 2, bearing in mind that this definition in Part 2 tells us that this is an electrical system for electrical equipment provided to protect or warn persons in the event of a hazard or essential to their evacuation from a location. So this could well include a domestic hardwired fire alarm, see our free training package on domestic fire alarms for more information, meaning that most domestic properties would require surge protection. And finally, three, significant financial or data loss. Again, under the auspices of late stage capitalism, there's nothing more likely to bring people out in a cold sweat and make them install surge protection than the thought of losing money. But did you notice in the introductory sentence to that paragraph, it said shall be provided, that shall means that to be compliant with the regs in any installations that fit those three bullet points, you have to install surge protection. Maybe something like this one from the circuit protection range by BG. But there's a little more to this reg as it concludes. For all other cases, protection against transient overvoltages shall be provided unless the owner of the installation declares it is not required due to any loss or damage being tolerable and they accept the risk of damage to equipment and any consequential loss. So basically what this is saying is that if surge protection is required for any of the three points mentioned there, then it must be installed. There's no way around it. But if those conditions don't exist, then you must install surge protection unless the owner of the installation tells you that they don't want it and that they're happy to accept the risk of loss associated with not installing surge protection. You would hope that if the person was of a reasonable frame of mind and you explained the minimal cost of surge protection against the damage a surge could cause to equipment that most buildings will house, for example TVs, speakers, cooking and cleaning appliances and so forth, that the owner of the property would opt for the surge protection to be installed. If they decide they properly don't want it for some reason, it would be a really good idea to get that in writing. Of course, you could save yourself all that trouble of explaining surge protection and outlining the options, and just install it as standard anyway. The other requirement in this section on overvoltage is regulation 443.32 with the heading transient overvoltages caused by equipment. This paragraph relates to surges in voltage that can be caused by machinery switching on and off, usually ones that are inductive or capacitive in their nature like motors, transformers and capacitor banks, or loads that draw a lot of current. Interestingly though, this regulation starts by saying that protection against this kind of overvoltage shall be considered. It doesn't say installed, so this regulation is a little less forthright than the one just before it. However, an interesting point to note is that in regulation 443.1.1, which outlines the scope and object of this section of the regs, it has this sentence. In general, switching overvoltages have lower amplitude than transient overvoltages of atmospheric origin, 
and therefore the requirements regarding protection against transient overvoltages of atmospheric origin normally cover protection against switching overvoltages. So what this is saying is that surges in voltage caused by lightning strikes on the supply system are usually more severe than the surges caused by machinery switching on and off. So logically, if you've protected your installation against surges caused by lightning strikes on the supply network, which is most likely happening as standard as mentioned before, then chances are you're automatically protected against surges caused by equipment. To summarise, the changes in the regs to the requirements for surge protection have made the decision much simpler and much more stringent. In fact, you'd have to do more work to justify not installing it than just installing it. That brings to a conclusion this series of videos on circuit protection. If you're watching on our training platform, then answer the multiple choice questions that follow and you'll receive your certificate for your CPD records. If you're watching on one of our social media channels, then click the link to move over to the free training and get yourself a certificate or click this video right here to see some awesome products from BG. All that remains in this series is to say thank you very much for watching.